you're supposed to be scared on Halloween. People go out of their way to dress up as ghouls and goblins in the spirit of this holiday to scare you. But as a parent, there's always been something scarier underlying an important part of October 31st. Your child trick-or-treating and receiving poison candy. On Halloween 1974 in Pasadena, Texas, the O'Brien family would live that very nightmare. Eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien is dressed up as a monkey from the Planet of the Apes, and his five-year-old sister Elizabeth was a princess. Their father, Ronald, having just gotten off work as an optician, rushed home because there was rain in the forecast, and he didn't want the kids to be disappointed. Once home, he didn't even take off his uniform, gathered his two excited kids, and met up with the neighbor, a man named Jim Bates, and his son, Whitney. The kids, of course, were anxious to fill up their bags with as much candy as possible as they waltzed along. When they reached one particular house, their cries of, Trick or treat! was met with silence. They rang the doorbell. Trick or treat! The door remained closed, but no matter. There were plenty of houses left. So as the kids were already heading towards the next house, Timothy's father, Ronald, noticed that a person had finally opened the door to the previous house. Not wanting to break the happy strides of the group, he stayed behind and collected five giant-sized pixie sticks for each kid. Ronald caught up with the group with the good news and handed each child a stick. He still had two sticks left, so he gave them to a couple of kids he recognized from church where he served as a deacon. Shortly after, the sky started to open up, eventually putting an early end to Halloween. That night, just before bed, Timothy asked his parents if he could have a few pieces of candy. To his delight, they told him he could, so he laid out his stash and chose his favorites and ended up deciding on the pixie sticks. With the help of his father, the cumbersome straw was opened and Timothy tipped the sweet candy powder into his mouth. He turned to his dad, made a disgusted face and complained how bitter it was. His dad quickly went to the kitchen to get some Kool-Aid to help offset the bad taste. Timothy drank it, but then his stomach started hurting. The boy got up and ran to the bathroom where he started violently convulsing as his body tried to throw up whatever he had ingested. Ronald rushed into the bathroom to aid his son, frantically telling his wife Daneen to call for an ambulance as he cradled Timmy in his arms. The boy's eyes started to lose life. He was fading fast, but there was nothing Ronald could do but cry as Timothy's body goes limp. Timothy O'Brien would die on the way to the hospital Pathology reports concluded that he had ingested enough potassium cyanide to kill two full-grown adults. It was traced back to the pixie sticks, which still had remnants of the poison. Ronald O'Brien was asked to detail his account of the entire night as the police immediately went into action. Ronald's daughter Elizabeth, fortunately, had not eaten the candy, so the police's first move was to find the other three children. Whitney Bates and one of the church kids had also not gotten to the pixie sticks yet. But the same could not be said of the last child. When the police informed his parents of what happened to Timothy O'Brien, everyone frantically rushed to his room where they found him laying, unmoving, on his bed with the pixie sticks in his hand. One could only imagine the level of fear in that room to see this. And then the absolute relief when they realized the pixie sticks was not open. When they woke him up, he told them that he was trying to open the candy, but wasn't able to get the staple off and just fell asleep. And no, the candy company did not simply just staple their candy shut. That's how the culprit resealed it, and all four of the unopened 20-inch pixie sticks had around two inches of cyanide at the top. The police did a dragnet, scouring the community for more tainted candy, informing everyone in the area that a boy had lost his life after eating poisoned candy. The community was terrified. The story went on to receive a lot of media coverage, horrifying parents all across America that a lunatic was poisoning children's candy in Texas. It became, and still is today, the greatest concern of parents when it comes to Halloween. During the investigation, a few eyebrows were raised 
at the behavior of Ronald O'Brien, the victim's own father. Pasadena detectives took note that there were no tears, just a quote-unquote hangdog look about him, in contrast to his wife, Daneen, who was clearly devastated. Ronald's recollection of the night seemed a bit spotty as well, for being so recent, such as not remembering what house he got the candy from and not seeing the person that gave it to him, stating it was just an arm that reached out and gave him the candy. Once detectives learned from Jim Bates that they had only gone down two streets before being rained out, they knew something strange was going on with Ronald's memory. When pressed by detectives further, Ronald suddenly got his memory back while leading the police up and down the streets. The house he pointed out belonged to an air traffic controller named Eric Melvin. Detectives showed up to Hobby Airport, where Mr. Melvin was a supervisor. They placed him under arrest in front of his bewildered colleagues, but this was short-lived because he had an airtight alibi. He was still at work when the kids received the candy, and he had 200 employees that he interacted with that night to vouch for him. He didn't clock out of work until 11 p.m., well past the horrible events of the night. Ronald O'Brien had become their number one suspect at this point, and they started to dig into his past. Turns out that he had been living way beyond his means. His debt racked up to $100,000 at the time. Converted for inflation is equivalent to owing over $600,000 today. Also, his house had just been foreclosed on, so financially, the O'Briens were fucked. They learned that he was employed by over 20 different companies in the span of just 10 years, and his current job as an optician was also in jeopardy due to theft allegations. They then uncovered a history of fraudulent insurance claims throughout these years. Things weren't looking so good for Ronald's character, but still it didn't give him a motive to murder his children along with three other kids, until they peeled over another layer. He had recently taken out a $30,000 life insurance policy on his 8-year-old son, Timothy, and another $30,000 on his 5-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. When Daneen O'Brien, Ronald's wife, was confronted about these policies, she had no clue what the detectives were talking about because Ronald purchased the policies without her knowledge. But besides this, Ronald O'Brien decides to make sure he looked as guilty as possible just hours after his son tragically dies guess who is calling the insurance company ready to collect now insurance companies are naturally suspicious when they have to fork out money so they immediately report this behavior to the police police would then search the o'brien house and find a pocket knife with pixie residue on it theorizing that he used it to cut the initial packaging. They also visited his current place of employment, and while interviewing one of Ronald's co-workers, a chemical salesman, said that Ronald had asked numerous questions about different kinds of poisons and where to get some, in which the co-worker informed him of a Houston chemical outlet. They went directly to that outlet where they learned what appeared to be the nail in the coffin. The store said that Ronald O'Brien did show up to their store looking to buy potassium cyanide, yet leaving without making a purchase because of a five pound minimum. But the intent was there. Ronald Clark O'Brien was charged with the murder of his son and the attempted murder of his daughter and three other children. His motive for giving the other kids the sticks was basically collateral damage needed to make it look like there was a serial poisoner that night. The jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death. On March 31st of 1984, he was executed by lethal injection. He will now always be known as the Candyman, the man that killed Halloween. My name is Killian. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Much love to my Patreon subs, because YouTube does not allow me to monetize true crime. Consider supporting to allow me to continue. And have yourself a safe Halloween. Halloween.